packets are, packets are posted. There are no enemy in sight. The service may commence, sir. Half charge is timed out. Please be seated wherever you can find a seat. Any rock or grassy knoll will do. A very warm welcome to you this afternoon for this conventicle, con conventus conventicle, covenanters conventicle rather, and a very warm welcome to those who are visiting with us, uh, especially notes of the uh, Deputy Provost, Colette Stevenson and uh, Jeannie Strang, and others from uh, the committee of the uh, uh, Cameronian uh, Association and the Covenanters Associations as well. We're here for an act of worship as well as an act of commemoration. And so we begin our worship this afternoon, singing together Psalm 121. We find it in the order of service, I to the hill will lift mine eyes. From whence doth come mine aid. My safety cometh from the Lord, who heaven and earth have made. Thy foot he'll not let slide, nor will he slumber that thee keeps. Behold, he that keeps Israel, he slumbers not, nor sleeps. And so on to the end of the psalm, Psalm 121 from the beginning. I to the hill will lift mine eyes. I to the hills will lift mine eyes, from whence doth come my aid. My safety cometh from the Lord, who have none that hath made. Thy foot he'll not let slide, nor will Behold, he that keeps Israel, he slumbers not nor sleeps. The Lord thee keeps, the Lord thy shade on thy right hand doth stay. The moon by night thee shall not smite, nor yet the sun by day. The Lord shall keep thy soul, he shall preserve thee from Henceforth I go Call upon the name of the Lord, let us pray. Almighty God, in this place it is our desire to worship Thee, for Thou only art God, and before Thee we have an accounting to make. For Thou art the God who has made the heavens high, and all that in them is. Thou art the God who has created this mighty universe with the power of the suns and stars and all the moons and planets in their orbits. 
And this thou hast done, and thou hast done well. We give thanks to thee that whilst thou art a mighty God, thou hast condescended to look upon thy servants. And so we pray that at this time and in this place, we might be made ready to welcome the presence of our Lord and King. For thou art a mighty God, and thou art a mighty King. And our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is the Son at thy right hand, hath done wonderfully in our sight, and hath provided so much of our necessity in all things, so that we are able to declare that thou art our God, and we are thy people. For all that thou hast done, we render thee the praise, the honour, and the glory, as the deserving one, and the one of might of old. But we acknowledge, Lord, for all thy righteous commands to us, and that thou art holy and true, that we ourselves have not kept thy commands as we ought. There are many ways in which we have failed thee, in thought and in word and in deed. And thy holy writ has provided for us instruction on how we ought to comport ourselves, and yet we find ourselves, Lord, to have failed thee in every respect, so that all we can say is did the publican before the face of God in the temple, whilst even the Pharisee stood at his right side condemning him, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Forgive us, Lord, for all that we have done wrong. Forgive us of our sins in whatever way they present themselves. Forgive us the breach that comes before us and thee, for we are mortal, and who can stand before the mighty God? And so we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us with a mighty forgiving by means of the blood of Christ himself, which has been shed, that we might approach thee, that we might take knowledge of thee, that we might know ourselves forgiven, absolved, of all that we have done in this life, in the past, even in the present, and on into the future. And so, Heavenly Father, we give thanks at this time for your goodness to us. We thank you for the goodness in providing your Son, whom we adore, and who rightly has first place among us, for he is the firstborn amongst many brethren. We give thanks for him, who is our delight, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your support of us, feeble as we are. We give thanks for your protection for us in times past and even at this hour. We pray that we might know security from all who might assail us. To this end, Lord, we pray that thou wouldst bless the pickets that have been set at this place to be diligent and have a watchful eye, whilst at the same time, paying cognizance to the fact that we have one who has an all-seeing eye, who watches over all that we do, all that we say, all that we even think. Watch over us then, Lord, we pray. From thine own strength we ask it, that thou wouldst do us good. We thank thee, Lord, for the many ways in which we are cared for and, and concerned with, we thank you for the forms of government which we find in this land, which at this time are beneficial to us. And we pray, Lord, that that would always be the case. We ask, Lord, that all those that are in authority would seek justice and seek mercy whilst yet it might be found. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would incline their minds and their hearts, that they would look to thine own holy word in finding their the root of all justice and mercy, that they themselves might perform it. For where they stray, we pray that you would forgive them. We pray too that you would move their hearts, that they would seek that forgiveness, and that they would seek your face, that they might know the right way in which to walk. 
that they would prepare the way of the Lord and be blessed within it. We thank you, Lord, for times of safety and the safety that we see in so many respects in life. We thank you for the safety of life and limb over this past weekend and the, the large fire which took place in Glasgow and which even yet is being tended to. We thank you that so many were survived from that so safe rather than having life taken at this time. And so too we think of many other instances where life and limb is at risk. We think about our troops wherever they might be found throughout this planet. We thank you, Lord, that you continue with them, that you abide with them, that you are their safety, you are their song. We ask for them that they might know your presence, they might know security in your name, that you would overshadow them with your wings, and that in thee they would abide. In all these things, Lord, we give thanks. We ask, Lord, that you would hear our pray for prayers for succor, that you would help us, that you would guide us in all the walks and ways of life in which we enter in. We pray that thou wouldst help us. We ask that peace would reign in our lives and in our country and at this time. We ask that we might be ruled by that Prince of Peace, that swan who has that superlative name, the name above every name, that in the name of Jesus all might bow. We pray that peace, not just in our lives, but also for all who would hear it. And so at this time we ask that your gospel message, which is Christ and is of Christ, that it would flourish in our land, this land which has, since the times long by, been known as the land of the book, that it would turn to thee and listen to thy word, and in hearing it, people from far and abroad might see that God himself has visited this place. May then your gospel message flourish. May then the peace which only thou can supply rain down upon us and help us that we might honor and praise and laud thee as the only wise God now and evermore. Amen. We listen to the word of God as we find it in the epistle to the Hebrews and chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, some small verses at the conclusion of this chapter. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do so, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rehab perished not with them that believed not 
when she had received the spies and peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jethi, of David also and of Samuel and of the prophets who, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, and escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weaknesses they were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. Amen. And I call upon David Bryce to address us. Thank you, David. First of all, on behalf of the Covenant of Rose Association, I'd like to extend a thanks to the Minister, Office of Beers and Members of the Old Parish Church. It's a privilege to be able to join with you in worship today, especially since you have such a sound covenanting background. I'd like to extend the apologies of our President, Mr Bill Nevin, who would love to have been with us today, but unfortunately because of an accident at home, is under some pain and realised at the last moment that uh, it would be wrong to uh, come here. But uh, I'm sure his heart is as hard as here today. The Covenanters Memorials Association has existed for over 50 years. It started with two old, wonderful old men of sterling character going around, sometimes hitching lifts, travelling all over the country with the packs on their back, restoring and titivating Covenanters monuments. It has grown considerably since then. And today we are well known with a great number of councils for working with them on guiding and advising them and sometimes helping to finance the restoration of covenanting memorials that is under their control. We, we do, there are many projects we take on in our own way. We plan the project and we pay the cost of it in totality. And this way we keep Scotland's covenanting heritage alive. Because before the First World War, Scotland was a much smaller place and there was more covenanting memorials than there was to any other body or any other battle or any other group, more of them in Scotland than any of, of the rest. The other aspect of our association now is propagating the memory and understanding of the covenanters. For many years, that would have been totally unnecessary. Not totally unnecessary, but it would have been unnecessary because with the great tradition of oral history, people would tell you, when they met you years ago, they learned about the covenanters from their grannies or their mothers near. But that oral tradition has gone. Nowadays, the focus in history, as in more modern historical events, like the First World War, uh, no, I'm not throwing stones at the First World War, I say that, don't make any misunderstanding. But the focus is in modern historical events. And the tragedy is, that means that people have forgotten or don't know about some of the most important events, some of the milestones in the civil and religious liberty that we enjoy today in Scotland. <coughs> They don't know things like in 1638 when the king had begun to interfere with how we in Scotland would worship and the people reacted against that and drew up 
the Scottish National Covenant. Now we hear a great deal about the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was between the king and the barons, in other words, the natural rulers of the country. But Scotland's covenant was a much more radical document. It was a document of the people and by the people. A document that went to every parish in Scotland to be signed. In other words, the majority of people, the great bulk of the people who signed that document were like you and I, rank and file members, rank and file buddies in all of the parishes. The people who signed that document saw this document as a covenant between them and God. Now if that seems strange, just think of your Old Testament and think of the number of times that there was covenants between, between the Israelites and, and God over some particular issue. In it, they laid down the fundamentals of their belief and they gave the king loyalty, providing he accepted their right to hold these fundamental beliefs and providing he accepted their right to practice and worship according to these fundamental beliefs. That was totally unheard of. I have searched in history for decades and never found another country where they sent the people en masse, sent a document to the king and saying, we will only continue to observe your sovereignty if you obey our religious beliefs. It was as radical, it was as radical as that. <laughs> then, along came later, his son, Charles II, a man with 13 mistresses and a great number of illegitimate children to go with his mistresses. He decided that he would impose bishops on the kirk. Obviously, with all these mistresses and children, it wasn't for godly reasons. It was so that he could control the kirk, so it would come under his control. Upwards a third of the ministers left their charges rather than submit. Now remember, not only did they leave their charges, they had to leave the parish. They had to go beyond the bounds of the parish. They could no longer live in that particular area. Then the people, a great legion of the people, decided that they would walk many miles to the lonely grains and moors of Scotland to hear a preacher of their choice, to sing psalms, to read the Bible, to pray, just as we are doing today, as simple as that. That was declared illegal. And for that, they were, if they were caught, and troops of soldiers were out deliberately looking for conventionals to break up and take prison, if they were caught, they were fined, were imprisoned, they were tortured, they were hung. Sometimes if they were high ranking, they were, had the dignity of an execution, having a head cut off, and sometimes they were shot on the spot. Understandably, while that oppression was great, there was a reaction, a rebellion against it. There were two rebellions against it when the Covenanters were defeated. But nevertheless, they kept to their biblical faith. And that's what gave them the strength of conviction to stay by their biblical faith, irrespective of much they suffered. They did so until Charles II took a step too far. The step too far was to begin to interfere with the Church of England and interfere in the ruling of the Church of England. That Adam deposed and another elected in his stead. Then the Covenanters got what they wanted. The Church of Scotland was restored to its normal dignity in 1690. 
The covenanting period was a milestone in the evolution of our civil and religious liberties. We should never forget how that the covenanters stayed faithful, held their faith aloft and suffered for their faith. Would we today, facing these testing circumstances, this is a question I often ask myself, would we face up to these circumstances and remain faithful to and continue with your cause, continue with believing and exhibiting your belief in the covenant? We should also pray and give thanks to God for the strong biblical based faith that they had because it was that biblical based faith that gave them the strength of conviction. Those who gave their life for Christ's crown and covenant paid the price to, to have removed from Scotland the tyranny and arbitrary power of a series of short kings. And what resulted? The people of Scotland and the people of the rest of Britain had freedoms that were greatly in advance of the rest of the United Kingdom or the rest of Europe. So their achievement being to stay firm to their cause until we had freedoms of that nature means that the covenanters are something we in the covenanter Memorials Association will never forget and I suggest that we Scots should never forget that either. Thank you. Thank you there Mr Bryce. We'll now have an, an offering brought forward for the work of the SCMA. At least momentarily we will. And in the interval, while we wait for uh, George just to come with the bags there, please come in from the back. Just to mention that the service we have today is styled as more or less in the form that the Covenanters would have known. As uh, David quite rightly brought to our attention there, they would travel for miles around to get to a service, and often at great risk to their own lives and to the lives also of their family, of home and hearth. Their form of worship was simple. They would listen to the word read. They would sing purely from scripture alone, from the Psalms themselves, presented, led by someone who had the word in his hand. And as many at that time were either illiterate, but certainly had no copy of scripture available to them, and simply preached as well. Now, the good news is, this is not going to be a three hour sermon this afternoon, because some of those services really could go on and on and on. <laughs> so it'll be far shorter than that. It should be about an hour, all told. But so the style of the service that we're enjoying today is in that kind of a style. Different times, different times.
we dedicate these offerings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the work of the SCMA and all that they do to remind people up and down the country of our history, that significant part of our history that uh, dedicated itself especially to you, a country that covenanted itself to you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, these offerings might be dedicated to that purpose, but always to your praise, honour and glory. Amen. We listen now to another portion of Scripture read, and uh, Mrs. Nessie Garrett will read to us the Epistle of Colossians in the first chapter, and picking up the reading at the verse marked 15. Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn Son, superior to all created things. For through him God created everything in heaven and on earth. The seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers and authorities. God created the whole universe through him and for him. Christ created, existed before all things, and in union with him, all things have their proper place. He is the head of his body, the church. He is the source of the body's life. He is the firstborn son who was raised from death in order that he alone might have the first place in all things. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. Amen. Amen indeed, and may the Lord bless those readings of his own holy and inspired word, and to him be the praise. Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'd like this afternoon just to pick up some of these verses that we've considered both in the letter to Hebrews and the letter to the Colossians. And one of the key things that comes out in the first reading from the Hebrews is this particular phrase again and again and again, by faith, by faith, by faith. And in the second uh, reading that we read just there in our hearing in Colossians chapter 1, that it was by him and through him and for him and in him and in him and through him and by him. Christ has the preeminence in all of these verses. And it's to Christ alone that we bow as we read these words and as we take uh, uh, words that are brought into our hearing for our benefit, that we find ourselves moved by all that he has done. But we begin, first of all, in this letter to the Hebrews and chapter 11. And throughout this chapter, we find an experience here of the people of God. We begin with the people of God and what their experience was in worshipping God. Because we find a long list of those within that chapter who put faith in God. The chapter itself begins a little earlier, talking about the faith of Abraham, the faith of Isaac, the faith of Jacob, the faith of Joseph, before finally arriving at Moses. And all that was done in the experience of Moses. And that's a good place to spend some time because of so many of the books of the Old Testament. Particularly that Pentateuch, that first five books of the Bible, which we are led to believe were written by Moses and showed the instructions that he had for God's people. And we pick up our reading this afternoon at verse, the verse Mark 29, where 
we find the exodus taking place. We're not talking about miracles of plagues and difficulties. We're not talking about the experience of God's people in bondage as they found themselves in Egypt. But we find the experience of God's people ready to cross out of the land of slavery, slavery and looking forward to the land of promise, the land of milk and honey. In verse 29, we read then this way, By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. By faith, they crossed. But whatever means it was that God was enabled them to pass over that particular portion of the sea, they crossed over and they found their salvation on the other side. This is a passage of scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, and also referring to it here in Hebrews, that we remember at times of baptism. Because this, it could be said, was one of the first baptisms which was performed as the whole nation together, covenanted before God, passed through the belly of the sea, through the waters, and found themselves on the other side. This then is an important passage of scripture when we think about our Christian walk and all that takes place in our experience, looking to that promised land which Christ himself has purchased for us. But notice the contrast. In that self-same verse, we find that they weren't alone in attempting to cross the sea. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they had attempted to do the same, were drowned. They did not put faith in God. They did not have the faith that this people of God had. Instead, they were up to mischief. They looked to wipe out the people of God at that particular time. But God had already set his mark upon them. He had already determined that he would save them by the power of his own right hand. And so save them he did. But those who had no faith and in fact attempted to do the opposite were the ones who found themselves fighting to their detriment. So often we find that in history. Time and time again. We've heard a little of history just a little earlier there. And I thank Mr. Bryce for his comments there again about the time of the Covenanters. And with respect to the travesty of what was taking place, the hardships that they experienced, but ultimately things worked out for those who were uh, following after the Lord and hoped indeed to be able to worship simply and effectively the Lord their God. But this wasn't the, the extent of their experience. The people of God had left at that time from a land of slavery, and they were looking forward to a time of promise, but they found themselves wandering, wandering in a wilderness for many, many years. There's a similarity for you and I. A similarity for you and I. In a later chapter, just two chapters later, the writer to the Hebrews again highlights the plight of God's people. And here he highlights that for us too, we have no continuing city. We have nowhere necessarily to lay down our head as Christ himself had it. There are times in our experience when we find ourselves perhaps cast adrift, looking for some help. And where does it come? looking to the Lord our God. And as we even sang in that first Psalm 121, I to the hills will lift mine eyes from whence doth come mine aid. The Lord himself looks after his people. And so we look forward in faith too that he would continue to look after us. We have no abiding city here in this place, but rather our hope, our promised land, is a heavenly one. And that surely is our ultimate desire. The experience of God's people uh, under Moses and then beyond, as they try to enter that promised land so many years later, was one of battle, one of upset, one of uproar and outrage. 
So the very next part of the account tells us that when under uh, Joshua they entered into the land, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled seven days. The victory was theirs. And the victory was theirs by faith, the victory was theirs by prayer, and by doing what God had required of them. In the battle that they faced there, the very earth shook and the walls came tumbling down. Is this not the experience of God's people again, or at least in their hope, their precious hope, that walls and strongholds or those who might oppose might come tumbling down? Again, it's by faith. But not all perished in that particular conflict. Not all perished. And here the writer of Hebrews picks out and singularly identifies one with their family who did not perish. Because again, by faith, Rahab, who was a prostitute in that city, did not perish with those who were disobedient. Because she'd given a friendly welcome to those who had come in. By faith, she was saved. And this was regardless of her background. Regardless of her background, her faith saw her through. Now, we perhaps are the only ones who know what skeletons might be residing in our own closets. We might only be the only ones, we think, who know what our background is, what has been our experience, and what we've done in life, perhaps, in times past. But, and we prayed about this a little earlier, we have this to hang on to. Whatever we think of ourselves and whatever we think of our past, that Jesus himself moved in circles with tax collectors and with sinners. With the well-off too, but sadly so often they disclaimed him. They disdained him. But so his company was so often with those who would lend a hearing ear. Those who knew their need of their saviour. Those who knew that by faith they might hang on to that one who had given them a friendly welcome. And so Rahab, back in that distant time in history, who had given a welcome and a friendly welcome at that to those who had been seeking a place to stay, did not perish when the walls came tumbling down. But by faith, she found her salvation. At this point, the writer of Hebrews states, what more should I say? And what more should I say? He then gives a list of those others who time and time again show themselves faithful to God. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel and the prophets. So many various prophets, so many various faithful ones who would follow. A veritable cloud of witnesses to all that God would do. And time and time again, they give witness to what God was doing in their own time and in their own place. And the result, though at times with hardship, was that God blessed them, God led them, God showed them what he would have them do. And so we're instructed that these ones, these many ones that are mentioned, through faith, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of weakness. They became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. And these are just a few of the things that God's people were able to do by faith and being led by their Lord and by their King. It's no wonder that this is a passage of scripture that we hear perhaps at a number of conventicles. As we remember the, uh, the covenanters and all that they found in their experience. Also the aid that they received from the likes of the Cameronians in all their guises. 
the way that they too were made mighty in war and putting foreign armies to flight, and the blessing that God gave them time and time again in honoring the faith that they put in him. It's no longer that, no wonder rather that God blessed them in such a way and that they had sworn to a covenant. They'd sworn a solemn league and covenant too, that they would follow God in all that he would require of them. It's very much like the passage we find in Deuteronomy chapter 30, where Moses himself, who we've spoken a little of, had this to say. As he neared the end of his life, and that transition would be made from him who would not go into the land itself, but who had fought mightily for God. But as they were to transition to the leadership of Joshua, whose name is Salvation is God, that they would go on into that promised land. And he made this declaration before the people as they swore to it. I summon heaven and earth to witness against you this day. I offer you the choice of life or death, blessing or curse. Choose life and then you and your descendants will live. Love the Lord your God. Obey him and hold fast to him. That is life for you and length of days in the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He presented them with a choice, and they swore to it to uphold that covenant and to follow their God. That was Israel. Have we a modern Israel in Scotland? For those hundreds of years ago, as a nation, in every single clan, in every single town and village up and down this land, our forefathers swore to the covenant. And in swearing to the covenant, swearing to love the Lord our God and to obey him and to hold fast to him, we were promised length of days and life and here we are. Here we are, those hundreds of years later. And are we upholding that covenant? Maybe individually. Maybe our hope would be as churches of the Kirk up and down the land. Some ways yes, in other ways no. As a nation, sadly far, far from it. But God is not without witness. And God is not without testimony. So that we find that wherever he works, there is evidence of the way in which he works and the salvation that he gives to many, many people. So even when there are just small numbers, he blesses that itself. And when there are those that are following after his precepts, for those who are obeying him and holding fast to him and loving the Lord our God, that we give a witness to those who might see it, just as the covenanters themselves bore testimony and witness to their strong determination to follow after God. Will we show such determination? Will we show such determination? found throughout that first book, in, uh, or letter rather, in Hebrews chapter 11, that key refrain that kept coming through again and again and again, by faith, by faith, by faith and through faith, these ones were made strong even out of weakness. And so we're encouraged then that we too, by faith, can be made strong even in our weakness. And so we might ask, faith in what? Faith in who? Faith surely in God Almighty himself and in his Christ in all that he has uh, put there for our blessing. And this is here where briefly we come to this letter of Colossians. Because we find there instructions about Christ that give us great confidence as to who he is. And I suppose in many ways the, the key to this is in the very first verse that we read. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. 
He's the first, the firstborn of all creation. And in what we continue to read thereafter, we find him the first in all things. And that all things are possible by him and through him. Him who is our Lord and who is our King. We're instructed that by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. Visible, that we see around us, but also invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. He's the first. He's the first in all things. He is the preeminent in all things. And he intercedes for us in all things. All things were created by him and through him and for him for his own good pleasure. And he sustains all things. And through him is our hope, not just in this life, but also in the life to come. God was in him, and through him was the reconciliation of the world. I suppose when we think about the experience that we have in life, with all of its challenges, so often is the case, the challenges in our family lives, in our neighborhoods, for those round and about us, the challenges we see on the news round and about the world and all that's taking place with conflicts here, there and everywhere. The historical conflicts which we have our attention brought to again this afternoon. Do we not sometimes just long for a little peace? Just a little peace? And yet this is the one of whom we are told that he is the prince of peace. And in following him in every age and through whatever challenges we find, we can receive peace for our souls. And in the most trying of times, we can have a peace which God himself gives us on high through Christ who is the first. By way of recap, it's all of faith. By way of recap, even though our sins be a scarlet, just like Rahab the prostitute, with skeletons in our cupboards, we are the kind of people that Christ sought out to give peace. Though we find ourselves in turmoil or warfare, he can give us peace. He is the first. He is our first. He is our last as well. And the peace that Christ himself gives is an enduring peace for the salvation of our souls. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you that your word has been read in this place and that we have been able to sing the words of Psalms as well and also consider the words that you have provided for us for our education and for our, our best endeavors in all that we do in this world. But we thank you that at the last accounting, the thing that is truly important is that of our faith. We thank you that you close in with us whatever we find within our own lives. You willingly forgive us and grant us peace. We thank you too, Heavenly Father, that at this time, we did not struggle to worship as some have in times past. And yet you gave them a sense of peace in all the travail of their souls, and so too you give us peace in so many different ways. We wonder at times whether we live too much in peace, because the covenant with which our forefathers swore is not one that we find upheld in our time and in our generation. And so we ask, Lord, that the gospel itself might be furthered in our land, that it would indeed flourish, and that we might find ourselves having seasons of refreshment and blessing and peace for the sake of Christ our Lord and King, in whose name we pray and with whose words we also pray together, saying, Our Father, 
which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We sing Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength. God is our refuge and our strength in straits are presented. Therefore, although the earth remove, we will not be afraid. Though hills are Though waters roaring make and troubled be, yea, though the hills by swelling seas to shake, a river is whose streams make glad the sea. forth from this place and as we move on to the next portion of what we consider this day may the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace amen <laughs>